Uh, today we are very happy to have Bo Dai from uh, Georgia Tech. Bo is a, a PhD candidate uh, in the College of Computing, advised by Le Song, and he has done very interesting work in uh, machine learning, in particular on uh, kernel methods, uh, probabilistic graphic models. Mm -hmm. And more recently, he has been working on uh, reinforcement learning. I think he can uh, talk about both aspects. Yeah. OK. OK. Uh, thanks for having me here. As Ling interested, introduced, I'm Bo. I came from Georgia Tech. So today I will talk about uh, exploiting the structure information in machine learning. So the first slide shows you why the structure information is important. Uh, yeah, in real world, we met a lot of structured data like RNA, sorry, RNA, uh, RNA uh, sequence which is represented a lot of the amino, uh, amino acid acids. And also, we represent the molecular with graphs. And uh, in sequential decision problems, we observe a lot of sequence of state, action, reward, and so on and so forth. And uh, another one is more even difficult is that in population evolution problem, we only observe the distribution of the populations every time step and we have a sequence of distributions. So this is totally different from the traditional machine learning where we deal with the uh, vector or matrix. So in such kind of applications, the structure information is very important. So let's first use the sequential decision problem as an example. So for example, we want an uh, agent to learn how to work, and uh, we collect data through through this procedure. Like at the beginning, we sample a first state from an initial distribution. And then it follows some policy to take actions. And uh, these two things together will get a reward. And uh, then the agent will transfer to another, another state following the trans transition distribution. And uh, we collect the data, so on and so forth. And uh, the whole procedure will give you a trajectory of the, the sequence of state, action, and the reward, so on and so forth. And uh, the ultimate target of the sequ sequential decision problem is that we want to maximize the accumulated, accumulated uh, reward. Here, uh, gamma is said to be a discount factor, which is in 0 and 1, so that this uh, summation is valid. And in machine learning, we call this reinforcement learning, but actually, they are the same problems. Uh, so machine learning, actually, it's quite uh, wide applied recently. It's particularly suitable for the task where we don't know the direct supervision information, and we only know roughly uh, indirect inf supervi supervised information. And uh, for example, in chatbot, we don't know which reply for a particular sentence is good. We only know whether this conversation is makes sense or not. And also in playing the, the uh, Go, even humans don't know which one is the best movement. And for the robotic control, well, human know some idea about uh, how to do that, but just only for humans. So when it comes to the robotics, because it, they have different mechanical designs. So actually, we don't know which one is the best movement for them. Under such a scenario, the reinforcement learning is the most natural choice. A second example is we want to learn, uh, we want to do supervised learning on graphs. This is almost the same as traditional supervised learning. But the only with one exception is that the observation for x is not a vector currently has become a graph. And what you'll learn is that you want to learn a function which maps the graph to its target value. Uh, my work is, OK, this one is uh, particularly useful for organic uh, molecular design. Uh, traditional idea in selecting the particular suitable molecular for organic cellular design is that uh, they 
expert first propose a lot of candidates molecular, and then the, they do testing for each molecular, and finally find the best one. This one is very cost because for each testing, it costs both time and money. Mm. And uh, once we have the uh, function which maps the, the molecular to a particular value related to the task, we can do molecular screening to narrow down the search space. For, for example, here, we have the function f, which, max, uh, which mapping the molecule to its power conversation efficiency. And then we can cancel out several molecules, which is uh, impossible to make uh, the solid cell work. And then we only need to, sorry, we only need to search on these two molecules to see which one is best. So my work is uh, basically focused on structured data. So we, I want to design the principled and practical models and graphs which can e exploit the structure information and also efficient in terms of statistic and uh, computational. And also, I want to have some theoretical guarantees for that. So with this kind of idea, my work lies in optimization and utilize optimization for reinforcement reinforcement learning, and also Bayesian graphing model and kernel method, and finally, deep learning. So today I will talk about, first work about uh, op apply optimization to reinforcement learning. And uh, then I will talk about uh, deep learning to utilize deep learning to model the structured data. Okay, that's, uh, I will start the first part of the work which is smooth the Bellman error embedding control. Well, this work uh, is partially done here. Work with uh, Ling Xiao and uh, Jian Shu and uh, Li Hong. Okay, let's first start the ultimate target for reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, we want to maximize the accumulative reward. So fortunately, we can, we can just uh, rewrite the object function into an expectation of something. And uh, you know, if we have such kind of formulation, the most natural way is that we can do utilize stochastic gradient to solve it. And the people already done that 20 years ago, uh, which is by Sutton and uh, his group. Basically, they calculated the stochastic gradient for this object function. And uh, in practice, because the maximal cannot calculate, so it's truncated somewhere. So that's why we just a summation to t. Mm, the good thing f for this algorithm is that it's always converge because the stochastic gradient. The bad thing is that uh, you know variance of this estimator is very huge, and uh, also because the formulation of this uh, estimator it requires sample from current policy dish policy, which means it is on policy and sample efficient inefficient. And uh, finally, because it truncated somewhere, it is biased. So cons consider these three disadvantages. We always ask whether there's a better way to learn policy. Good thing is, uh, yes, we can, as long as we explore the recursion relationship in the reinforcement learning. Uh, because of Markovian transition property and also the definition of V star, we can rewrite the V star into a very famous relationship called Bellman op optimality equation. Uh, so the optimal, uh, so the searching optimal policy becomes solving such equations. So it's very natural that when you deal with equations, you need uh, the iterative method is a good way. So. Indeed, people do that. There's a lot of different variants for the iterative method, but all of them could be follow the same style as I listed here. It's like you start from initial value functions, and then you update the value functions again and again. So it's kind of like the current value function is trying to provide your virtual label and then you'll do regression based on that virtual label to update your value functions. So in reinforcement learning, this kind of method is sometimes called bootstrapping. 
uh, Q-learning is kind of a variant of such kind of iterations. Mm. The good thing for Q-learning is that it can explore the off-policy data, and also its variance is much smaller than previous policy gradient. And uh, another good thing is it's indeed converge. When you utilize the tabular case for the value function uh, representation, why? Because the Bellman operation itself is contractive. So based on the Banach fixed point iteration, uh, point iteration theory, this indeed converge. But uh, let's see what happened in practice. In practice, sometimes we uh, we must face the case where the state and action space is very huge. So we need to parameterize the Q function and uh, deep Q learning network and deep deterministic policy gradient are two famous variants uh, to inject the parameterization into Q learning. And uh, in most cases, it works quite well as we wished. Uh, this is a graph from OpenAI block. So here are four different lines representing four different variants of deep Q learning. Mm. But uh, when we inject the uh, parameterization, the contractive property is no longer hold in the parameterized function space. So it can be diverged, which is this case. Basically, you see, it's, we never know when to stop the algorithm. So let's recap here. For the two existing two categories for reinforcement learning, the policy gradient is good at its converge. And, uh, it, but it's very bad because the sample efficiency is very bad. And also, it has high variance. Contracted to that, the parameterized Q-learning is good at uh, sample efficiency and uh, variance is small. But it's not convert when you inject a parameterization. So we are trying to, we're always very greedy. So we are trying to see whether that's good algorithm to try to combine this two. Yeah, please. So <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't understand when it does not convert. When you, when you... So you said that there's some theorem that guarantees that it should converge? Under some particular parameterization. And that's what it's sample efficient? Uh, so it's only sample efficient when you can guarantee conversion? No, 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 that's not the case. Let's go back to the slide here. So when you utilize the vector, which is tabular case to parameterize V here, it's the contractive property is only hold for L infinite norm. And when you inject the parameterization, so you cannot uh, hold for the norm in terms of that particular parameterization space. So the theorem doesn't hold anymore. Because then you, can, then you cannot say anything. It's not sample efficient. It's nothing, right? Uh, it's, it can learn something. So that's, I say, sample efficient. So what does sample efficient mean if you cannot converge? Uh, no, it's converge? not that's, that's just, it's sample, com sample efficient here means whether you can utilize the off policy sample no matter it's converged or not. Again, whether you can utilize? Uh, of policy sample, which means the sample is not from your current policy. It's, a, it's provided by another behavior policy. You can learn something there under some special case. But uh, in general, it's not hold. Uh, OK. Actually, the convergence is a long-standing problem. Uh, and uh, we don't have much progress until, sorry, until our, our paper, which is smooth Bellman error embedding. We have both three property here. Mm, let's give an overview of our algorithm. So as we said, we want to solve a Bellman equation. So instead of solving that equation, we transfer to uh, optimization view. So we solve this optimization to get a solution. Uh, and also, this optimization is very difficult to solve. So we transfer, uh, we approximate using a saddle point formulation. And uh, under such formulation, we apply stochastic gradient there. We get something. Yeah, please. What is the expectation over S? Like, what's the distribution of S there? Yeah, good questions. Uh, S here is the distribution over the state space. Induced by what? Uh, it can be arbitrary distribution as long as it covers the whole space. Mm. 
Let's see how we can arrive at such reformulation. Uh -huh. I mean, are we supposed to read or...? or no, actually, uh, this is only an overview for what I did. So we transfer the original formulation to a set of point, and uh, we prove something based on this set of point formulation. And, and will we understand this set of point? Or what? Will you, will you explain this set of point? Where no, yeah, I will explain later. So let's see the original <coughs> formulation for the optimization. You see, it's very difficult because two things. First one, you need to take maximum over a function. And this maximum operator makes object function non-convex, non-smooth. And second thing is it's nested with a conditional expectation. And uh, in general, we don't know the transaction transition distribution. So this expectation actually makes the object function intractable. Mm -hmm. The max of the pi, you mean the action A is pi of S? Uh, the, uh, pi stands for policy, so it's like uh, given the state, you need to select uh, action. So it's maximum over a function. Excellent. But mm -hmm. now the action A that you have written in the expectation? A is sample from the pi. So here in notation, expectation so, pi means a sample from that particular pi. So pi is not a deterministic mapping? No. Uh, okay, we will handle these two difficulties one by one. First, see, we, we want to cancel out the max operator here. So the max gives you non-smooth object function. So one straightforward idea is whether I can smooth it. So I introduced the uh, conjugate smoothing technique to the left-hand side of the equation. And it arrives the new Bellman equation here. It's a little bit different from traditional conjugate smoothing technique because the op op optimal value is also appearing on the right-hand side. So we can utilize such relationship to slightly modify the original Bellman equation. So we change this one to here. And we can show that these two equations are the, uh, equivalent in the sense that they both have the same solution. As long as I can solve the second one, the solution is definitely the solution to the first one. Is there entropy inside the max or outside the max? Uh, this is the whole thing. Because entropy itself contains an integral over pi. Okay, okay. So if you want to inject into the expectation, you need to just lambda log, negative lambda log there. Is there a max? So in the second equation, pi is unbound, right? So Second equation, pi. What do you mean by unbound? So, I mean to say, what, what does the pi in the second equation stand for? Is that like an overall max over pi or? Second, there's no maximum. Okay, so then what does minus lambda log pi, what does that pi mean? This pi is, oh, here's a solution. Uh, here is an <coughs> equation with respect to both v and pi. You see, as long as you solve the second equation with respect to both v and pi, the particular v is also the solution to the first equation. And also that pi is uh, corresponding to the max operation there. Basically the second this equation is point-wise across all pi. Yeah, exactly. All pi function and all policy. Oh, you want this for all pi? Yeah. 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 All pi. All, all pi. Value function, all value function. Everything. And then you will imply this first one. I see. Okay. A good thing for the second one is we don't have the max operation anymore. So it's very natural to get uh, our surrogate optimization here. And a byproduct, a byproduct is that, you see, this equation is with respect to all action, which means you can sample as long with arbitrary behavior policy, as long as it covers the whole support of actions, <coughs> given a particular state. I still don't understand. The pi in the second one is it going to be the the, the maximizing pi in the first, or we will solve it. What? When, when you solve it, mm -hmm. yeah, so the solution is going to be the maximum pi? The maximum yes. Pi. yes. It's not that it's valid, there was some misunderstanding here. It's not that it's valid for all pi. Just for exactly, the exactly. Pi. That's what I said. Okay, so you need to solve the equation. You yeah, need to solve, solve the equation. The, equation yeah. the solution is the maximum. Uh -huh, yes. And then, yes. Yeah. What you mean is uh, it surfaced for all the states, not for all the pi. Is that true? Uh -huh. 
But I don't this should hold for all x. <coughs> for the a action. Yeah. If lambda was zero, then I, there is something I don't get. I mean, this equation would. Uh, lambda, lambda cannot be pi. zero. Lambda has to be. Not be lambda has to be positive. Mm -hmm. That's one Otherwise restriction. You, you cannot just erase the lambda. Then this two is not equal. Uh, okay. Any questions about the this equation transformation? Okay, cool. Uh, so we get the our object function now, but it's still it's very difficult to solve because the ex conditional expectation is inside the square function. So we cannot direct apply the stochastic gradient here because we cannot get a unbiased gradient with use, uh, using just one sample. So next slide will deal with this conditional expectation. Yeah, the two is utilize the conjugate functions. I think uh, everyone sitting here is very know very well about the conjugate functions. Let's take the square function as an example. Uh, we can rewrite the square function as a maximum operation over a dual variable. Uh, yeah, and then we plug such relationship into the object function, and we get we arrived here. Still, the conditional expectation uh, and the outside expectation is separated, so we don't have any progress, and uh, we cannot simply f uh, extract the max outside because these two are not equivalent. Whatever I did. We extract outside with one slightly change. We don't optimize over a single variable. We optimize over a function. Uh, and we prove this to our equivalent. Actually, the intuition for this switch is uh, very simple. Let's look at this line. For each S and A, you will have its corresponding maximum uh, new. And then you collect all of them and build a mapping from S and A to the mu. And actually, this function is the solution to the last two lines. Yeah, anything about this slide? Uh -huh. Question on the previous slide. No I mean, it's a question of the whole thing. So the eventual V that you solve and get, the V and the phi that you solve and get, mm -hmm. Only solves like the lambda regularized. Uh, not equivalent to not, It's not equivalent to the original Bellman optimal. Exactly. That you care about, uh -huh. right? So how far? Yeah, we characterized that okay. in the paper. <laughs> Good questions, actually. Uh, that's that's what I'm trying to talk later, but uh, okay. you already find it. So we can solve the we change the uh, object function to a max over. Joint distribution, joint expectation, over here, and then if we denote this one as phi, we have the object function here. And uh, well, because in all policy setting we don't have the the policy cannot in pure off policy setting, the policy cannot interact with the environment. The sample are all provided by a behavior policy, so we direct target on that setting, and the, we approximate the expectation with that. Of policy samples empirical finite summation. So it denotes as phi hat here. And then the left thing is we want to solve this min max problem. Uh, we divide it into two cases. First the case is that we can indeed solve the max operation. And second case is uh, if we use some neural nets parameterization for inner new, we don't have that max. So we only update with the gradient, stochastic gradient here. For the outside v and pi, we always update with stochastic gradient. And this com composes our algorithm to solving this set of point problem. OK, here is some analysis for the convergence. Uh, as we said, if we are only given one of policy samples, which are dependent, and uh, we give we we parameterize the v pi new with different parameterizing function. We have different convergence uh, convergent results. For v pi mu, which are parameterized to use arbitrary nonlinear functions, we can guarantee the previous algorithm converge to a local Nash equilibrium. 
uh, which stands for the gradient for both v pi and gradient for mu is equal to zero. It's no longer move. What if we can if we parameterize the inner mu as a linear function or kernel function, in which we can get to the maximum parameterization? The algorithm converge to a different point of original problems. And uh, even special, if we parameterize the v pi mu into uh, two layer neural nets with value activation functions, we prove that the algorithm converge to a global optimal solution. Two layer is, is one hidden layer? Exactly, one hidden layer, and then output. Seems like a surprising result. Mm -hmm. It really relates to the recent works which says that when you train on a two layer regular neural network, then all the minimum is equivalent to global minimum? Uh, yes. Actually, this here is not a station local minimum. Here's uh, every local Nash equilibrium is will be a global optimal solution to the original problems. Uh, that's a little bit tricky because uh, we explore two properties. First one is object function itself is only square functions. Uh, this is also most of cases for the current analysis for neural nets. And the second thing is uh, we analyze the, the property of the ReLU. And also that's also very important in our analysis to push the basis function with high probability to have a, a can be expanded as a full space. But this result is without any assumption. It's like just a... uh, With some assumption about the uh, how you get a sample. Actually, the sample here is dependent, so we have assumption about uh, the dependence should be beta mixing. If it's converted to IID, it's also work because beta mixing is more or general than IID assumptions. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, this is the result about uh, convergence. So next, we analyze the special case uh, where we parameterize the v pi mu as two layer neural nets, we show that the algorithm output a function. And that one is approximation to the v star in grade one over square root of t with some actual error. This actual error, including the, as you said, I smooth slides the Bellman equation. That will introduce some bias. And also, I utilize the parameterization. So it also introduced some approximation error there. Uh, this term is statistic error. I split it outside because, as I claim, this algorithm is sample uh, efficient. And uh, why? We can compare to the existing results for the policy gradient sample complexity. And uh, a particular Q learning, which can be proved converge under very restrict assumption. Uh, our results is one over square root of t, it's much, much better than the even restricted uh, Q-learning. Here, dA stands for the dimension of your actions. And the policy gradient, it cannot learn from just one of policy, of policy samples. It, uh, t here means the trajectory length, m here means how many trajectory you need from just a, a current on policy. So that's why it's extremely sample inefficient. Uh -huh. Can you go back to one slide? Mm -hmm. For the last case, when you solve the min-max problem, and you solve it, uh, for I just the min-max problem, you solve it to the optimal, no, or you just... No, I just get one step. Okay. Because as, as I said, I proved that every local Nash equilibrium is a global optimal solution to the original problem. Yeah, any questions about here? <clears throat> I'm finding it hard to compare the bounds. So in the, in the Kakadi bound, in the policy gradient, uh -huh. T is in the numerator? What is that? What is that uh, yeah, saying? that's what I said. In that case, you cannot sample from one trajectory. You need many trajectory. The M stands for how many trajectory you get. And the T stands for the trajectory length. So here's a... <coughs> In that case, I guess policy gradient. 
each row out of one policy, one run means a one sample. Uh -huh, yeah. Square root m is the how many sample you get? You have if you need m such track for samples. This so is the square root of mm -hmm. m cover. It gets worse and worse with the length of this. Exactly. Sample. Exactly. Because the variance become worse and worse when you increase the length of the trajectory. Wait, why, do, why doesn't m grow proportionally to t? Uh, that will give. That means you require a lot of samples compared you can, to you can do that. here. You need to sample way more to make it converge. Yeah. So, so in that sense, policy gradient is sample inefficient. Uh, okay, it's time to to show well, the. Well, 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 well. So this the the error bound there. I think is. Overall error bound, right? Yeah, that's including overall. Including the approximation of the uh, of the solution to the to the solution of the smooth version, which and then also the smooth version, the exact smooth version to the original uh, Bellman equation with the maximum operator. I think. Uh, yeah, I should. Everything is just yeah, I should. Yeah, I should. It should include all yeah. those yeah, uh, approximation error, automation error all together. Is that bound? And uh, here I list just a statistic error because I want to compare the two terms, particularly to the first term here. Uh, yeah, so it's time to evaluate the empirical performance of the proposed algorithm. Here we compare to the benchmark, which is module called local motion task. And we compare to both the state of art current on policy algorithm, which is DOAC and the TRPO, and also the current off policy algorithm, which is DDPG. And uh, you can see the blue curve is ours. It's far more better than the existing algorithm here. Yeah, please. Can you tell us how you pick lambda in these things? Mm. The smoothness? Uh, good questions. Actually, we don't have a particular way to put lambda. We just tilt it as a hyperparameter here. As in my paper, actually, we do the ablation study for the effect of lambda. And indeed, in some uh, real-world application, the lambda affect the performance of the whole algorithm. Yeah, please. Sorry, I didn't hear. These are all using on-policy samples? Or? No, no. Uh, for uh, DDPG and our algorithm, we use off-policy. And for DOEs and TRPO, because they only designed for on policy samples, so we follow their setting. So they have an advantage also. They're, they're getting better samples. So. Uh, I, it depends, like, what is the behavior policy under which you're generating samples for DDPG and SB? Uh, we, we kind of explore the experience replay here. Please. It seems that the green one, the the DT uh, PG, <coughs> is the, is very very different across the three. Exactly, factors. that's what I'm going to mention. But as you ask, that's because this this three environment is totally different. This one and the inverse double point theorem is unstable. So if if it fails and uh, it doesn't collect the good samples, it cannot learn anything. But this one is stable. The environment is stable, so you don't worry. You can. Uh, you can always collect the good samples to promote your uh, to promote your uh, policy. So that's why this one all also increase. Yeah, please. I just had a question. One more question on the bounds. The so that's the policy gradient bound. Is that just for vanilla policy gradient, or is that for where you've done a variance reduction? No, like this is just for the vanilla policy gradient. Is there but doing like a Actor critic or any kind of base, any kind of variance reduction is. Uh, really I we, we, I do realize that kind of work, but uh, I cannot find any some uh, some complexity for uh, for that because you know the baseline for policy gradient uh, po redu policy gradient re reduction it also needs some samples, ah. so we don't know how to characterize that kind of sample required. Variance reduction, we would expect that to grow poorly with the length of the trajectory, right? Yeah, I'm just curious, like how how much, well, how much. I mean, I, assume, I would assume it would make a huge difference. Like, no no variance reduction it usually doesn't work at all. So you uh -huh. have to the variance reduction makes a huge difference. So I'm assuming it would make a huge difference in the bound as yeah. well. But this bound, uh, I don't know existing bound for that. Yeah, I, I have that's no what idea. Yeah, I was just curious. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, thanks.
uh, for definitely for this tool, we, we, we definitely inject the, the baseline for reduced variance. Otherwise, yeah. basically, this tool will never work. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's see some uh, algorithm behavior. Uh, let's take this swimmer as an example. At the first uh, several iterations, it's not, not performs quite well. But as you see, as you see, after only eight iterations, it performs quite well. It can m learn how to move, and later it learn to uh, move to the right direction. And so the same behavior happens in this two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so and also. Uh, this is a very general tool. We can apply it to the policy evaluation problem. Policy evaluation is even simpler than policy optimization because we need, only need to solve a Bellman equation without max, and the policy is predefined and it's given to you. So we only need to handle the expect, conditional expectation here. And the uh, same trick we applied, we, we get to the settle point formulation, and we also get to similar uh, statistic error analysis here. Yeah, please. <laughs> okay, here's the summary. We propose the smooth Bellman error embedding control, which is the first algorithm that proves convergence with off policy samples with almost all differential models and exploiting the recursion structures. And the take home message is that settle point optimization indeed provides us a new perspective to explore the recursion structure here. I think I want to point out, in general, people may not want to just um, parameterize these neural networks with only two layers. They want to go deeper. Then do you have any guarantee about the uh, max problem? The difficulty is that when you have more layer, uh, it's the base, base of the neural nets become more and more nonlinear. Yeah. So it's very difficult to analyze the property of the basis. So, uh -huh. uh, currently, I don't have any idea for how to extend the current method we use to analyze the two layer neural nets. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's my answer. I don't have a straight idea how to do that. Okay, uh, any questions about the talk, first part? I'm just still uh, so surprised by the strength of the result, like uh, for the two-layer uh, neural networks. You know, if if you were just doing supervised learning, mm -hmm. then we only know very weak results, even for learning two-layer neural network. So I'm I'm confused. You know, either you need to make strong assumption about where the data come from. You know, it's either Gaussian oh. or it's a well-specified model, and you know there there is. The data was produced by a neural network, and maybe even the neural network had random weights or something like that. Uh, I think I, I should under, answer this question like there indeed have some paper, uh, which appear not in a very famous conference, which is uh, ASDATS last year talking about uh, uh, if you use two layer neural nets and you just want to solve a surprise learning, and indeed they have some guarantee there. The key point is uh, with Ralun. You can analyze the spectra of the the basis with high probability, okay. including how many neurons you utilized. But that one, it will go to the probability. The more, the better, basically. Can you tell me which paper it is? Uh, the paper name is that diversity leads to better general generalization. Okay. okay. I will look. I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds like mm -hmm. uh, many many people are missing this. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, the second part we will, I will talk about is uh, for graph prediction. So we, pre we propose a, a structure work model to do graph prediction. This work is joint work with uh, Han Jundai and uh, Li Song. Okay, let's see the graph prediction problem. As, as I introduced, the graph prediction is that the input itself is a graph and you want either to do classification as the second task or the regression. So before our algorithm, actually the most uh, dominant algorithm for such kind of problem is that you first desire a kernel, and then 
you utilize the existing current method for the kernel to do classification or regression for graph. Uh, the reason we want to design kernel instead of direct the feature for graph is that sometimes uh, you design kernel for modeling the similarity between two graphs. It's much easier than you simply design a, a feature for graphs. But uh, if you utilize the kernel method, actually, definitely we know that it's not very scalable because you need to either implicit or explicit to save the kernel matrix. And then, because the kernel is predefined, and uh, it may be not very suitable for your target. So the question is whether we can design an algorithm which is <coughs> both scalable and also it can learn both feature and the classifier jointly. That's the motivation for our work. And indeed, we, we, we did that. The key idea here is that we're modeling the graph, utilize a random, marked random field with little variable. The reason why we change the graph to a distribution is that graph isomorphism is NP-hard problems. And uh, when you design feature for that, for the graphs, you need to take care of that, that kind of NP-complete problem, NP-hard problem. Uh, but when you change this graph to distribution, any permutation for the nodes doesn't affect the distribution. So the distribution itself naturally avoids such uh, graph isomorphism problems. So we transfer the graph pr prediction problem to a distribution predict prediction problem. Uh, yes, then we can first get the posterior for the Lisbon variable and utilize that as input for your class file. So if you literally do such kind of step, you need to first learn the parameters for this model. And then you need to do inference. And finally, you need to use the posterior as input to do supervised learning. Now this thing is easy, because this one is an uh, undirected graphing model. You need to handle with the uh, intractable integral. Same thing happens in the inference. So how can we do that? It seems this idea is not very, very useful. So the good thing is that we can implicitly learn with posterior by neural nets. Let's first see how we achieve there. If we ha if assume we already have the prime transition for the mark random field, we want just want to infer the posterior, and uh, with the mean field inference. We can solve this uh, fixed point. And the solution for this fixed point is the posterior approximation. Take example, you want to get the posterior for the QH1. You just grab the neighborhood information and do uh, aggregation. In terms of op operation view, it's trying to solve such re recursion re uh, equations. With such a kind of understanding, we can parameterize the uh, operator using a single layer neural nets. And because our ultimate target is not just to predict the uh, posterior, we are trying to use posterior, posterior as features to do classification problems. So we, we don't need the exactly W1, W2 to match the meal as posterior. We can use the supervised information to learn W1, W2. And so let's put everything together. This is how we do the whole algorithm. We first initialize the latent variable with random, either random or set to all to zero, and then aggregate them, uh, neighborhood information. And this is, this is iteration one for each node. And we do this to iteration t. And then we aggregate this as features either concatenate or summation, and plug this one as features for final layer supervised, supervised task. And we can learn both the, the parameters for extract features from graph and also the classifier by minimizing this object function through the back propagation. So this is how we deal with the graph. Yeah, please. You lost me back. So 
is this vector here some kind of representation of the posterior? Uh, you can thought in that way. Uh, because if not, then what is this concatenation of the neighbors actually representing? Uh, yeah, actually, this mean field only gave us a kind of the, uh, in intuition, and uh, it inspires us how can we do that thing. I see. You see, it's because the ultimate target is not just a, not do the posterior inference. We don't care about posterior. We only care about the classification. So that's why we don't need to learn exactly W1, W2 to match the posterior. We can use supervised information to, to learn that. And uh, actually, this, well, this neural net shares the similarity between convolution neural nets and also re, uh, RNN. It's similar to convolution neural nets because it collects the neighborhood information as filtering. And uh, it's similar to RNN because for each layer operation, they share the same prime transition. OK. OK. Here is the slides how this algorithm uh, performs compared to the uh, famous kernels on the st string classification problems. OK. As we can see, the uh, structure to VAC algorithm performs quite good compared to the existing kernel method. And this S2V loopy BP is that way, apply same idea to loopy BP instead of mean field. And also we, can, we apply the same idea, same algorithm to the uh, predicting efficiency of solar panel materials. In that data set, it's quite huge. It's like 2.3 million of data. And uh, we want to, each data is a graph. And we want to predict the graph's property of, uh, for power conversation efficiency. And here are the results. As we can see, the, our algorithm also achieves uh, state of the art results with much, much smaller prime transition. Compared to the WL kernel, that, that kernel is trying to count the uh, subtree in the graph. Level three and level six means how many, uh, how, how depths of the subtree. And uh, yeah, compared to these two famous kernel, we get relative error like four percent with ten thousand times smaller model. So this model is trained very efficient. Okay, summarize here. Uh, as we can see. We propose the structure to work model, which can handle the sequence trees and graphs in a uniform, unified framework. And also, this algorithm achieves the state of art on the uh, graph prediction problem with much smaller compact, much smaller models and more uh, efficient training. The take-home message is that neural nets enable us to incorporate structures into models. And it also enables us to learn the parameters end to end. OK, to hear any questions? OK, so then I would like to talk some future work. Uh, the first part is about the theoretical part. As we can see, I reformulated the reinforcement learning into solving a min max problem. But, uh, when I look back into the literature, actually there's not too many work conduct to, for the non-convex concave set of point problems. So in future, I would like to, uh, to both invent some stochastic algorithm for the set of point problems and also analysis their convergence rate. And in practical part, I would like to incorporate more uh, dependence into models, for example, in hierarchical IR. There is much, much rich uh, dependence in the models. And also some physical rules, for example, in molecule generalization. We know some of the molecules definitely not existing in practice because it, they didn't follow the physical rule. So how can we incorporate such kind of ID knowledge into our model is still far away to be answered. And also in reinforcement learning, we know that uh, some uh, action cannot be taken because it's forbidden by physical law. 
So how this can be incorporated into model is, is also not clear. In future, I would like to pursue in these two directions. And uh, here's some my publication. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah, please. So, for the first part, uh -huh. um, the, there seems to be at least, or I'm, I'm curious what are the kinds of lower bounds that we could argue about there, or whether those bounds are tight. Just the, uh, no. the thing that motivates me is arbitrary distributions over state action pairs would have given you essentially the same bound. Uh, not exactly. Not really? Uh, because you just needed full support, right? Yeah, I just need full support. But the lower bound, that's even difficult. Actually, let's see. For the first part... Yeah, sorry, this one. Without maximal operation, we don't know the exact lower bound for that. Not that you have mentioned you add the max operation into the Bellman equation. It's not clear. And uh, actually, uh, my colleague, colleague and I are working on these directions. We are trying to first figure out the lower bound for these optimizations instead of using max. It's not clear. And, and are you particularly convinced that the squared error like that is the best objective to be minimizing for this sort of bootstrapping target? Uh, good questions. Actually, we utilize the square function because two reasons. First one is in literature, people always use the Bellman error like square. And another thing is it's more stable than if you use just a, a absolute error or something error. It's more stable in practice. Yeah, you have some error used on there, like you just basically take the square root of it. It's a norm, right? Yeah, it's a norm. Because okay. it has some peak, it's not smooth, and you are optimizing over a function space. And you, you hope the uh, dual function is also smooth. When you change to the absolute error there, smoothness is not guaranteed. Is that being used in the literature past? Any interesting uh, algorithm come out from that? I don't think so. Okay, let's start again.